empty for a moment. Uh, forgive me. Does it does it show the wisdom of a huge buildup or indicate that it was unnecessarily excessive? No, I think uh, you can't uh, uh, ever have uh, a situation in which you have too little uh, for any kind of action where American forces are committed. Uh, that was one of our faults in Vietnam. It was one of the things we determined never to do uh, uh, on our watch. And I think that uh, uh, what we have so far is, uh, is an indication that the doctrine of going in with overwhelming force, if you have to go in, uh, is exactly the right way to do it. And I think that uh, General Powell and uh, Secretary Cheney, President Bush, are doing extraordinarily effectively what, what has to be done. It, it, this is still a, a, a long way from over. Where, where do you think the greatest danger still lies? Well, I think that uh, there will continually be danger when men are committed to combat. Uh, I think that you're going to have uh, many more air raids. I think it'll be almost around the clock. Uh, the power we have assembled out there is absolutely awesome with six carriers and hundreds of planes on the ground from, from many nations. Uh, and I think that they will just go in continuous waves until all of these military uh, targets, until these defensive installations, the radars, the missile sites, uh, airfields, uh, the communication routes leading from Baghdad down into Kuwait, all of these will have been destroyed or interdicted, and uh, that will take some time. I think we made remarkable progress last night. I think it's very unfortunate that Saddam Hussein insisted on a war, uh, and uh, he is bringing this on himself, and uh -huh. he, could, he could stop it. But uh, uh, until he does, uh, it will go on, or until he, is, uh, he and his regime are completely destroyed. Mr. Secretary, Saudi and, and Kuwaiti pilots, as you know, took part in, in last night's yeah. initial attack. D to your mind, does that answer the question of Arab willingness to fight Arabs, or, or is that still unproven? No, I don't think that's unproven at all, and I think that uh, I never had any question about that. I think everybody underestimates the hatred that Saddam Hussein engenders among uh, among uh, Arab peoples. Uh, you have the most remarkable coalition put together. Uh, the only Arab nation that is really with him in any sense that's close by at all is Yemen, and they really don't uh, amount to a, a very large uh, supporting force. Uh, so that I think that uh, you don't have any doubt that these people hate Saddam Hussein. Uh, the Saudi pilots, the Kuwaiti pilots, are extremely well trained with the very modern U.S. equipment, uh, and uh, they're doing exactly the kind of job that we all uh, hoped and expected them to do. Mr. Secretary, waging war is not easy, but no. maybe it can be argued that waging war is easier than waging peace sometimes. How do you think we ought to, we ought to be prepared to define victory? Well, I think victory in this case uh, would be, uh, first of all, getting Saddam Hussein completely out of Kuwait. Uh, secondly, uh, requiring that reparations be paid for the enormous damage that he did and for the whatever extent you can for the thousands of people he, he killed, murdered literally. Uh, and then I think he has to be left, and, and Iraq has to be left, without any war-making potential. And that may take an army of occupation, largely Arab, but uh, one way or another we have to be sure that uh, when this is finished and when he is is pushed out of Kuwait, he does not have the capability of going back in again in a few weeks and starting this all over again. That sounds so, like unconditional surrender. It is very close to it, and I have never found anything really wrong with unconditional surrender. In other words, if he backed off right now and said, okay, okay this scared me last night, I give up, what do we say? Well, I, I think that we, we accept that, but giving up means a lot more than letting him go home with his nuclear and his biological and chemical uh, uh, warfare ca capability It's not intact. enough if he just backed off and got out of Kuwait. Then. Well, I, not, not as far as I was concerned, no, because that enables him to come back in and do it all over again a few weeks after we all come home. Hmm. And then you and I would keep talking on into and throughout the year. Yes, we'd have a long <laughs> six-hour program, night after night. Mr. Secretary, thank you for coming on down and being in Washington. I know you thank want you. to get back to the vacation home in Maine. You, we track you down everywhere. Take thank care of yourself. Thank you very much. Okay. Here's Deb. I don't know that anybody can really vacation during a time like this, and certainly everybody's been glued to the television set. Just about as soon as rumors of war started coming in for Baghdad, millions of America simply stood still, hungry for news. But obviously nobody's been waiting more anxiously than the families of folks who are stationed in Saudi Arabia. And NBC's Roger O'Neill has a report on one family in Aurora, Colorado. The mother of an American GI. With war, Shirley Hartsfield was numb. The father. The quickness of the American attack shocked him. You know, I think we both expected it, but I didn't expect it this soon. You know, I, I expected it perhaps in the next day or two. Racked with emotion that only parents, wives, and children of American servicemen can know, the Hartsfields were desperate for every piece of information. Even though their son Derek, an army man with an artillery unit, was not in harm's way, 
yet. I keep looking at Derek's picture and I keep trying to think, you know, in my mind, what is he doing right now? And, and is he being protected and, and is, is he away from any gunfire? And um, my heart is with every family member. He, every family member who's got somebody over there right now because we're all going through this. And I know everyone's got these same feelings. A feeling of absolute helplessness. A five-month-long emotional roller coaster. From the high of seeing their son on the evening news for a brief second to the low of not knowing where he is this morning. Maybe I just thought, thought this was a dream or something, not, but not a dream, maybe a nightmare. The president's speech helped some. The preliminary reports of American warplanes hitting Iraqi targets helped some. But the fear was still overwhelming. Hi. I just wanted to know if Phyllis was with you. And from one father to all other fathers. Just hang in there. If any family wants to call us, they're free to. Talking with others appears to help. Sharing the worry. Worry that has really just begun. Roger O'Neill, NBC News, Aurora, Colorado. It's not just the families who are worried. And a little bit later in the broadcast, we'll be giving some numbers to check in with. We get a look at some of the, um, the jets overhead, uh, part of the coalition, uh, taking off uh, from the base in Dharan in uh, northern Saudi Arabia. We're going to come on back in just a moment and continue to look at Operation Desert Storm. Storm numbers. This. KWQC-TV, Channel 6, Davenport, Iowa. Good morning. The waiting is over in the Gulf. The war has begun. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Well, the biggest thing I saw was one of the most fantastic fireworks demonstrations I've seen since uh, our, uh, Fourth of July party uh, years and years and years ago. This was tremendous. Baghdad was lit up like a Christmas tree. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. For the last 14 hours, U.S. fighters and bombers have been pounding the strategic facilities in Iraq and Kuwait, the first phase of an air assault that figures to be unrelenting. The campaign will continue until the whole campaign is completed. It doesn't end. So far, Iraqi resistance has been minimal. But though Saddam Hussein has taken far more than he's given, he's vowing to fight on. Just hours ago, addressing his people, he said, the mother of all battles has started. The great showdown has begun. This is today, Thursday, January the 17th, 1991. From NBC News, this is a special edition of Today, America at War. Now, here are Bryant Gumbel and Deborah Norville. And good morning. Welcome to today and the special edition on a Thursday morning that finds this country at war with Iraq. And I guess we should not find that as a big surprise because the president has been telling us all along that unless and until and if, then this. Yeah. And it uh, came to that. But evidently, Saddam Hussein uh, took it as something of a surprise based on the uh, response that... Uh, early reports say uh, he was able to launch against the Allied right. forces. Yeah, it has it has not gone his way. We're going to bring you up to speed on Operation Desert Storm. It ceased to be Desert Shield when White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater read a presidential statement announcing that the liberation of Kuwait had begun. That was at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and by then, the first of many missiles and bombs were already striking Baghdad. And while the exact number of planes involved in that first wave has uh, still not been specified, it did involve several hundred sorties and the forces of not only the United States but also pilots from Great Britain, from Saudi Arabia and from Kuwait. And if we can agree that shooting qualifies as bad news, the good news on this Thursday morning is that while losses were expected to run very high in the early going, preliminary reports indicate relatively light Iraqi resistance. At this hour, Baghdad Radio is still claiming that Iraqi forces brought down 14 warplanes, but that's a claim that the Pentagon has labeled as ridiculous. 
the first explosion shook Baghdad in the uh, dawn hours under cover of darkness, and only now are we beginning to get scattered reports of just how much damage was done. We'll be checking in with Tom Aspel in just a little bit. But right now, let's go to Dharan, Saudi Arabia, where NBC News correspondent Mike Betcher is standing by. Mike, what can you tell us about the activity there at this hour? Well, I believe, Brian, we can uh, stop counting the attacks in waves because... Uh, the attacks seem to be constant. The takeoffs, at least from the area I'm standing in northeast Saudi Arabia, are constant. British jets taking off to the left of me, American F-15s taking off to the right of me. Uh, it's pretty much non-stop throughout the day. Now, we had a report earlier from British military sources that a British tornado jet crashed in the fighting. Uh, the two crewmen are missing. There was a report from the Iranian news agency that an American F-15E had crashed in the Gulf and that the two uh, pilots on board had ejected. I think we can look at that report with a great deal of skepticism at the present time. That same press agency is reporting that every 30 minutes, missiles, Iraqi missiles, are landing in the location where I'm standing now, and believe me, I would know if uh, <laughs> missiles were landing here every 30 minutes. Uh, so this is a very massive strike. Uh, observers, experts in the field of ordnance are saying that it's one and a half times greater than the attack on Hiroshima, the atom bomb there, and twice as powerful as the massive air raid on Dresden that created the huge firestorm in World War II. So we're looking at, indeed, a very, very mm. large air that's attack. In, that's in tonnage. We might, we might qualify that. Mike, Mike, I was watching last night when, when your signal went down and everybody else's too. What was the mood there? We were uh, a little concerned. Uh, I was uh, talking when the air raid uh, siren ran off. Uh, I grabbed the gas mask uh, out of my bag, uh, put the canister on it, screwed it on, and uh, Tom asked me, well, what do you hear? And I said, well, I think I hear a jet engine. And uh, continued to talk, and all of a sudden the screen went to hash. Uh, people then went downstairs to try to go to the bomb shelter, and then I thought, my wife's watching this, and she's gonna think that uh, a missile hit here. So I said uh, to one of our bosses here, uh, Bob McFarland, I said, I gotta go upstairs and get on the phone. So uh, got on the phone and uh, basically uh, called uh, into nightly news uh, for broadcast, but also to let my wife and my family know that uh, no missile had hit yet. Uh, That's a good thought. So uh, we thought that, uh, that inbound missiles were coming. Everyone expected a retaliation yeah. and uh, there was no retaliation, or the missiles couldn't get here, or they crashed. We just don't know yet. I'm sure your wife just loved that story of affection. Mike Betcher, <laughs> thanks very much. Let's go, let's go on to the Pentagon right now, in Washington, where our national correspondent Katie Kirk is standing by. Katie, anything new on your front? Well, actually, not yet, Brian. We should find out at 9 o'clock when uh, Dick Cheney and Colin Powell have a briefing here about what kind of uh, American losses were incurred as far as planes were concerned. Many military officials here say they would be very surprised if we didn't lose any planes in this kind of massive military strike. As Mike said, it was tremendous firepower. They were predicting that about 10 planes would be lost a day. Now, it might be that, uh, in fact, that's under that number, the, the actual loss of planes, but we should find out more in the upcoming hours. Now, we can report Pentagon officials ad nauseum, but let's hear from some of the U.S. pilots who were pretty pumped up after they completed their nighttime sorties. Watch the ground fire come up, and, and the first response was, gee, that's neat. And then the second response is, it's aimed at me. And then it became very realistic. You sit there, and you watch this stuff come up, and, and at some point you become comfortable almost with what you're doing because you're in your cockpit. And then you realize that this isn't the time to become comfortable with what you're doing because you've got stuff being aimed at you. you can't get overconfident. It's almost like scoring an early touchdown or something. You get overconfident, and they can still beat you 38-6 to six or something. Uh, the mission isn't over until it's over. And until you come back down on the ground and you go through your debrief, the mission is still going on. So until you get your feet back firmly on the ground, that's, that's the point when you can go, okay, I'm done.